Okay, we ready? All good. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Good to see you, Daniel. Great to All see right. you, Stan. All right, Daniel. So I'm gonna uh, introduce you a little bit. You're you're at San Diego State University, mm -hmm. right? And you're in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics, and That's you right. work in mathematics and science education. And you want to say more about your areas of work or specialization? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So first of all, just thank you for having me, Stan. I'm a big fan of your work and all the stuff that you're doing. So it's <laughs> an honor to be here with you. That was my um, honor. Thanks. And so, yeah, so so I'm at San Diego State University. It's a little bit of a unique environment because in our department, we have three divisions. There's math, statistics, and math education. And we have a pretty big math education group. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we try to we try to work with the other segments too. So it's not it's not too isolated. We're all kind of integrated together. And that's been really nice for me um, in my work because a lot of the stuff I do is in post-secondary math education. So, right. so it know, makes sense. To... It makes perfect. It's a great fit being there with the students, um, sometimes even studying our own classes yeah. is exciting. And then also, um, so we have a joint doctoral program with UCSD and uh -huh. that's sort of housed mostly within, we have a center for uh, math and science education research. It's cr called CRIMSI. Um, right. And so that's that's where we all collaborate across our departments. And so in that space, I can do the math education work. I can work with folks in science ed and you know, my own background is in math and engineering. Mm -hmm. So I try to work broadly, um, but for the most part, you know, the areas of my work have been around equity is kind of central and this equip tool that I've been co-developing. I'm sure we'll talk a lot about that. Yeah. And then a little bit um, coming out of my postdoc work was focused on systemic change and sort of understanding like institutional structures and how do we work within those to achieve our goals. And then mm -hmm. uh, more recently, uh, focus on disability work in, in math, but a little bit beyond that too. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks. And so Chris, today we're meeting because you recently published a book. So I'm going to Maybe just put it on the screen here for just a moment. So let's see if the screen share works. So there it is. Uh, Equitable and Engaging Mathematics Teaching, A Guide to Disrupting Hierarchies in the Classroom. So it's a really uh, catchy title and also very important <laughs> information here. Yeah. So um, so, so we're going to talk about the book, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, together today. And also, um, maybe we should just first talk about how you got into this, like what got you interested in in kind of moving in this direction with your work? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, I think this focus on equity goes back a really long time for me, um, really to adolescence. Um, so I'm a musician, I'm a, I'm uh -huh. a drummer, and I sort of got pulled into punk rock and the punk rock movement and those types of things um, in my rebellious teenage years. <laughs> and so, you know, stick it to the man, that, that kind of thing. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and so that that was sort of my first love. If I if I could have it my way, I probably would have been a musician rather than an academic. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, things don't always go as we plan. Yeah. And so that so that sort of that social justice bend has been there for me for a a very very long time you know that's that's how I, okay. I actually met my partner was thinking about you know different ways that the economic system could be more just and you know we kind of fell in love over nerding out about equity <laughs> so that's awesome you know it's awesome. central to my life in many ways and it's it's ironic because you know when I was in grad school at Berkeley um, equity really had nothing to do with anything that I was doing there um, except maybe peripherally, and you know, it was much more this sort of student thinking type of stuff, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't. It wasn't really until after I graduated that I had this realization that there was a way to sort of merge those loves of um, the social justice focus and um, the math education. And so that that was about ten years ago. Okay. Can't believe it. Um, but so I had a, a colleague, a colleague, Neryl Shaw, who I went to uh, grad school with. And when we graduated, we we both had this feeling that, you know, I think the work that we do in academia is important, but sometimes it doesn't always feel practical, you know, or it yeah. doesn't feel like we're we're always reaching the audience we want to. So that has been a guiding principle for for, you know, the past decade is trying to do work that would both be like rigorous research, but directly translate into practice that could support 
basically better experiences for students yeah. and particularly, you know, making math more exciting, engaging and accessible um, for minoritized folks who have been excluded from the community for far too long. Right. Well, I, I feel like that's a natural progression because if you if you want the classrooms to be better for for all students, then at some point you have to engage in thinking about equity because that, yeah. that's going to be revealed if you study this. Right. So. Right. Right. But that's, it's really cool. You started with punk rock and, you know, I, <laughs> right. I like hearing stories like this because, you know, it's not like, um, you know, we're robots and we were born like we like math. And then you go to high school and then go to college and then grad school. And it's like this linear path. It's not yeah. really how a lot of people get to where they are. So absolutely. Yeah, I really like that. OK. All right. So thanks for that. So I think we should jump to discourses. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is like a really um, to me, at least it's a unique perspective on the issue yeah. and that you frame it this way mm -hmm. so let me just pre uh, start off start us off with discourses so in your book you write a discourse is a collection of symbols signs artifacts and other cultural representations that work together to constitute the social world and then you go on and say discourses are mechanisms of power because they define what individuals are permitted to do within a social context. So that's a that's a really powerful mm -hmm. um definition of discourses. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So let's let's talk about that. Yeah, for sure. So so just to put that in context, right? So the book itself um is is really a culmination of work over the past decade um and things that we've been learning both from studying classrooms and then working with faculty. And so I'm going to I'm going to shout out to Neural here with this kind of discourse approach. Um, so, you know, when we started working together, I really had this background in kind of engineering design and, and this type of thing and uh -huh. his work on racial equity um, and, you know, getting really deep and nitty gritty in the theory that was kind of our both bringing our strengths. And so this post-structural perspective is one um, that he's used for a while and one that it, you know, he showed me could be very useful. Um, so this comes out of Foucault's work, um, okay. this post-structuralist way of um, thinking about what happens in classrooms. And so um, <clears throat> it feels jargony in a way, and it feels almost like <laughs> dense and impermeable. It's so academic it, right. when, you, right. when you read this definition. But I think, um, you know, the examples are really can be quite simple. So I, right. I have two young kids, and as parents know, being a parent defines so much of your life in so many ways, yeah, yeah, yeah. wonderful ways and also <laughs> uh, challenging ways. Um, and so, you know, my my oldest is, you know, very expressive in um, the types of clothing that he likes to wear, the colors that he likes to wear, um, things like that. And that was great until he was out in the social world and suddenly you know, finds these messages um, based on, you know, what aisle in the store do you have to go into to pick your clothing? Yeah. You know, well, you know, why can't, oh, I'm a boy. Why can't I find the clothes that I want in my section? It's all blue dinosaurs or or something like that. <laughs> blue and gray. Um, and blue and gray. Trucks and dinosaurs. Right? It's boring and he doesn't <laughs> like it. And then I think yeah. even, you know, so those are the subtle messages. Right. And then sort of the more overt ones, um, you know, you go to school and someone's like, hey, what, you know, why do you have girl pants on right. or these kind of um, mm -hmm. statements? And so it's alarming that at such a young age, you know, you see these sort of structures um, being reproduced and reinforced. Mm -hmm. um, and there's social consequences to not following um, sort of the order that is right? right. We you might know that you can do some. OK, if I'm at home, I can wear whatever I want. But if I want to go to school, if I wear a particular type of clothing, um, there will be consequences for that. And and then, yeah. you know, as individuals, we navigate whether um, we're willing to fight that or whether we just sort of succumb um, to the status quo. And so that's that's really how I think, you know, that's an example of sort of gendered discourses yeah. at yeah. play. Um, and, you know, young girls and, and women face all kinds of things or or just even this idea that like, gender is sort of this binary right that's a particular discourse right. about gender right. um that you know fortunately has been challenged quite a bit um more and more in recent times but that also that also comes with pushback that's so right. 
there can be you know, both sort of these social dimensions, yeah. but then even like legal dimensions and how we define and constitute right. a social world. Uh -huh, right. Like sports right now. Right. You're yeah. seeing yeah, who's allowed exactly. to play in what and et cetera. And I, I appreciate also the, the comment you make about um, your kids, because this happens from a very early age and you just walk into a store and you're already confronted with it. And if you go to school or daycare, there you go. Right. So, right. All right. Good. All right. So uh, what about discourses in mathematics? Yeah. So, so that's sort of, that. that's sort of the broad perspective, but yeah. math, um, you know, and I talk about this a lot more in the book, but I think it's just worth kind of mentioning that math is special in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the ways that it's special is sort of the status that it holds in society, mm -hmm. right? It's um, being good at math is sort of tantamount to being intelligent. Right. Um, and, and we see sort of the testing regime, standardized tests, you know, college entrance exams, the GRE, all these things that sort of dictate paths that are available to you based on mathematical performance. That's right. This um, English and, and math, right? Are the mm -hmm. two things that yeah. are on the standardized tests. Exactly. Yeah. And so there's this, and so, you know, keeping that in mind, I think often the how, and, and so that's one thing. And then the other thing being, there's sort of this idea of innateness. Like some people are math people right. and some people are not, right? And that maybe is largely innate. I think a lot of people believe that, although as educators, we fight against that every day. It's, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's uh, every semester you have to redo the whole, exactly, the whole exactly. thing again. Yeah, yeah. and I, I know that, you yeah. have a letter about this that you, you give your students, which I, I love that, how, how, you, how you framed it. Um, but so, you know, so keeping those sort of broad discourses in mind about math, then what we see is there's, you know, there's discourses about particular identities. You know, math is this very masculinized, cold, logical, aggressive kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, there's um, there's a paper about a, a draw mathematician, which is one that I love. To, I love to do this exercise with my students is, you know, on a first day of class, just ask them, you just like, draw me a picture of a mathematician and you gather them all up. It's anonymous. You can show this to the students and you, the stereotypes come out right mm -hmm. in 50% of the images. Yeah. And then other folks do other things that might uh, go against the stereotypes, but you sort of have this white masculine, um, often like a bald man with a pocket protector. Um, <laughs> right. He's like, very yeah, exactly. He's stressed <laughs> yeah. out lonely um it's <laughs> it's a really yeah. negative image um right. and i think we see folks who who don't identify with those things along dimensions of gender race disability um it has it has concrete impacts it has right. concrete impacts well sure if, if that's what it looks like to be a mathematician and you're not that then it's hard yeah. to feel like you belong Exactly. Just from just from the visual images of yeah. that we have it, that we're holding. Okay, so um, so that's really good to to look at these discourses and the framing, and then like examples that we see, and then so how does this get to our classrooms? You know, like yeah. So this is the I think this is the part that's actually scary about the discourses, and you know, some people frame things in terms of implicit bias that that can be useful yeah. sometimes. I don't I don't yeah. know that that's the framing I would take, um, but it shows up. You know, whether or not we believe the stereotypes, they still impact us because, like, sort of subconsciously, those are the messages that we that we see in the world around us. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that that can impact teaching in very subtle ways from, um, well, so, so Nirl and I, most of our work has been looking at classroom practice and participation yeah. and how that is afforded to different groups of students based on their identities. And the, the patterns so strongly aligned with these stereotypes in who belongs in math. Um, and that belong, and they align both in who the teachers choose to call on and which students feel comfortable participating in how right because they yeah. sort of yeah. feel that that space is for them so i think that's a very big way and when we when we know that doing mathematics is how we learn it that means some students get to benefit from our classes more than others unless we disrupt those very um 
patterns. So that's like one really big way. I think other things that we see um, that can be more subtle and sometimes is out of out of sight for instructors is things like microaggressions that come yeah. up in the classrooms, um, stereotype threats, teacher expectations. There's some really powerful research around that, um, around like, you know, elementary school girls and like how teachers perceive their performance. Again, very young, right? These are like right. seven-year-olds. Um, or, you know, Danny Martin has mm-hmm. written a lot around like teacher expectations around for black students. And, and so I think there, there's so much research out there that actually documents in really specific and concrete ways why these discourses are harmful. Mm, okay. That's really that's really amazing and also kind of daunting to like yeah. realize that it's there. And it's also <clears throat> it's hard because even if as you say like you there there are people who don't believe in these things or trying to work against them. But then if you say, all right, uh, you know, could someone like would someone like to share yeah. their solution to blah blah blah. But then the students who've come out of this these, you know, this discourse, this yeah. society that we have there, you know, there's going to be only some who feel like they, they have, there's, they feel safe to participate and share, yeah. or they feel entitled to share and other people's don't, other people don't, or other identities yeah. don't. And so yeah. even if, uh, um, at the de- default assumption that an instructor is trying to make it all equitable, it's already like not a level yeah. playing field. To yeah, begin with. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Which which that's why sort of my argument would be that if you don't try to disrupt the status quo, the the default is to just perpetuate it. Yeah. You actually have to you actually have to explicitly work against it or it will manifest in your classroom. Right. And frankly, even as someone who does this research and focuses on it every day, like <laughs> I see those same patterns coming up in my own teaching. Yeah. I'm like, oh, how do I disrupt? How do I do this? It's it's not easy. Is there nothing easy about it? But um, it's it's critical if we're trying to build the math community that we want to see. Mm-hmm. Good, good. All right. Um, what do you think? Should we should we look at now that we've kind of talked about this a way to frame this, which I really appreciate. Yeah. By the way, I don't think it's it's been talked about so kind of succinctly. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least that I've seen. I mean, maybe it has been, but uh, I really appreciate that in your book. Also, uh, kind of a side note. I appreciate the conversational style of that you mm-hmm. you chose to write the book because because some you you kind of mentioned like some uh, books they they're very um, academic and you you you're reading a research journal is really dense. This is like I'm having a when I'm reading it I feel like I'm having a conversation with you. Yeah. So it's it's, it's easy yeah. to read. Um, it's inviting. Um, you know, I feel like I'm invited into like go on yeah. this journey with you. So I appreciate that Thank kind you. of uh, writing style that you chose. I think it was it was a really good one yeah, to go thanks. that way. All right, so so maybe let's think about uh, now that we're in this space, uh, what are things we can do or avoid in the classroom mm-hmm. from your point of view? Yeah, so, well, and so just to your point, so just uh, a note on the book. Um, so first of all, thanks to the folks at the MAA Press for a yeah. lot of a lot of helpful feedback. Uh, sometimes frustrating to to make more fixes, but definitely very constructive and very useful to sort of yeah. get get it where it was, and even even around the title, um, and also just to say that's it's actually available for MAA members free. You can download the ebook, um, oh, nice. and I think the ebook's basically circulating enough that like if you want to find it, you can find it. <laughs> it's not <laughs> it's not a big thing, but, um, but, but yeah. you know I'm just gonna I'm just gonna leave it at that. Okay. Um, but uh, but also there's a there's a physical copy on Amazon that that folks can get and um, okay. you know you can you can ask your library to buy that yeah. for you or whatever there you want. You go. I so think that's, that's a good idea. That's the long version. You can get and basically you know it's just concrete strategies after concrete strategy to be super mm-hmm. practical. So let's let's talk about some of them here. But if you yeah. this is the teaser. If you're interested, right, right. we're not going to get through there all for of you. <laughs> you get get all book. of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is yeah. So like a little bit. I mean so. And this is kind of around chapter three is really about like setting the classroom environment and mm-hmm. um, how how we show up to our students, right? No, knowing that there's these stereotypes, um, you know, as as my good friend Robin Wilson talks about, it, like knowing that students might come into our classroom with math trauma from their prior experiences, yeah. um, and, you know, especially like for folks who look like me who come in the classroom, like your students have probably had bad experiences with other people that look like you. Um, and so 
you can kind of invoke that those prior traumas um just just by right. being there and so right. knowing that we gotta we gotta humanize ourselves and humanize the students i think sort of the starting place for that is like bringing ourselves to the classroom in an mm -hmm. authentic way getting to know our students helping you know build um community agreements like around how we want to interact um right. and, and and making it accessible right i think we'll, we might talk about this more later but and and we might feel like our students have access to um what's happening in the classroom but there could be any number of reasons why they just feel that they're just not even able to engage and so yeah being aware of those types of things and, and trying to be explicit let me, so let me jump in for just like so community agreements often do, these are called norms people will say i need to set norms for my classroom so um uh, what would maybe just say a couple of things about why you call it community agreements and how you might implement some of these yeah and so i think um this is a little like technical into the language, but sometimes this idea of norms is like, there's like a normal or right way to be. Right. Um, as, as opposed to like a community agreement as like, as people in the room, um, this is how we're deciding that we want to interact with each other. So it's mm -hmm. just, I think it's a very subtle piece of language that I've picked up from other folks, but I think yeah. it's a useful one. And, and also the idea that you know, as an instructor, we don't just like give the norms to our students. It's like, you must learn the norms of mathematical proof. <laughs> Feels not inviting sometimes. Yeah, but no, rather, not... um, <laughs> we're people, we're here together. Like, how can right. we make this space right. a learning space? And then, right. and so then having students be a part of that conversation. Um, and I, I, probably the most important thing I could say about that is, you know, doing that once on the first day of class or whatever, second day of class, that's great. But if you don't come back to the community agreements, mm -hmm. if you don't sort of not just remind, but kind of highlight the ways that they show up, mm -hmm. then the students have already forgotten them and they're going right. to go back to the normal way to <laughs> do repeat things. them. So it's kind of a summarize. You have to co-create these things. Some people have called it co-creating norms. I think they're doing the same kinds of things, mm -hmm. but the, the wording is just yeah, the, exactly. the name of it's different. And these community agreements, you're kind of coming, kind of deciding together the rules of engagement, mm -hmm. like how we're how are yeah. we going to treat each other, basically, yeah. and and what is yeah. acceptable and what is not acceptable. And, yep. Okay. Yeah, I like that. I like, but so I like that framing. And then you, uh, we're not gonna go over them here. Uh, go over them here, but in your book you have examples and yeah. how to set that up. So exactly another reason why to get the book. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So you talked about access, and then now we have a. Having regular opportunities to engage in open problems. It doesn't mean that every problem, every time, right. every task has to be open ended and you know, yeah. like this. So so let's talk about that. Well, why is that important? Yeah, I think you know, far too often um students don't experience math. They don't get to experience math in a way that's either interesting or useful. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I, so, I, so I'm going to come back to my kids again. I think about, you know, my oldest Munzo, like he's really interested in math. I mean, he sees me as a mathematician or math educator, which I think helps. Um, and then he goes to school and it's just like, not only is it just rote problem solving, half the time it's like, go sit on a Chromebook and use this software where you just grind problems as a little penguin walks across the screen. Sorry, Gigi. Um, <laughs> you know, and yeah. so it's like, in that, it's just, it's boring. It's yeah. not interesting. It's decontextualized. There's just, right. and I think students often have, you know, a decade of that's what math is. Yeah. And so they don't even see it as, well, frankly, connected to everything. Right. Um, so, but they can't see it as interesting or useful. And so I think yeah. when we give, some of these more open problems give our like a it's a trailer for like this is what mathematicians actually do this is what's actually makes it fun um and so yeah i think in all in the push for equity work we also have to think about the math like the math mm -hmm. has to be high quality um yeah. i think you know the particularly the work around like complex instruction um mm -hmm. this is a set of techniques for equitable teaching like they kind of ground like the group worthiness of a of a task is is foundational to getting students to collaborate well right so if we if our problem is like 
compute these seven limits when we're doing yeah. calculus, there's nothing for students to talk about. It's just like, I got seven. Oh, I got five. Mm -hmm. How did you do it? I'll show you my steps. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're right. Like, it's a very boring conversation. It's very narrow. It's very narrow. And so not, not that we never need to practice the skills, right? Like we do need concept. We need like procedural fluency. And I feel that so much as, as a musician, like sure. playing drums, like sometimes you just got to do the rudiments and just do them again and again and again and again, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but you can't do rudiments your whole life. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, I agree. It's like you, what, what is the point of the music should be sort of like central and then you got to go mm -hmm. practice and do the rudiments. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we see that in music, we see that in sports, right? You know, right. if you just teach a basketball player to shoot free throws, yeah. you're not going to have a, a player who's going to help you win games if that's right. all they can do, even if they're really good at it because right. they're... Exactly. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. Right, right, right. So there you go. So, all right. That's good. So so one of the things I guess you're also touching on is um, if we don't have high expectations for mm -hmm. all our students, then we won't yeah. give them these open challenging problems because right. we may not think they are able to yeah. do these problems. Exactly. And then that then means that they don't have access to the yep. fun math, the exciting math, and then right. they don't go into math because why would Absolutely. they? Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. All right. Um, productive struggle is another thing you, you point out. This is, a, this is a big one that I like. This is a big topic I like. Yeah. Is, yeah. Embracing struggle. Yeah. And I think, I think it goes right along with right, these interesting open, like interesting open math problems. You don't just solve them in five minutes. You have yeah. to like, <laughs> you have to go no. the wrong direction and me mess up. And, you know, you, you need time. You need a lot of time and, and, yeah. and openness to do that. And so, you know, it's, yeah, again, it's just like, how do we model that for our students? Mm -hmm. I mean, may maybe this is bad teaching practice, but you know, I, I think I've reached the point in my career where so often I just don't work out any math problems before I'm teaching them because then I can at least model authentically what yeah. it means to work on a problem. And I might actually get stuck and we might have to get unstuck as a class, mm -hmm. um, but it's just different from like, I know the solution to every rate related rates problem. And I know the trick for setting up which tangent or whatever, it is. you know, it's just, that's not really doing math. It's sort of recitation rather than um, yeah. the messiness of, yeah. of getting in there. And, and maybe it's okay for us to get embarrassed sometimes in the classroom. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. we want our students to be able to, to also do that, then we have to, not be perfect all the time. That's right. Or create these spaces where it could be, okay, today we're going to do this open-ended thing mm -hmm. and I don't know the answer either. And we're going to learn it together. You know that, and, yeah. and I can see that as like yeah. a, an excellent way to spend some of our class time. You yeah. know, so there's a understanding of where that comes from. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if we want to talk, you want to talk about anyways, uh, deconstructing stereotypes. I think this, some things, how do, how do we do that in the classroom? Yeah. Is, are there so, some strategies you have? So a, a couple of things that I, that I like, you know, so I, I talked about this draw mathematician thing. I think that's mm -hmm. a really yeah nice opening ta It's students find it amusing in ways, but it also surfaces some really important things. And I think it, it creates space for a conversation very early in the course. So that, that's what I like. Um, uh, uh, BK or Brian Katz has sort mm -hmm. of tuned me into using the math biographies and I know other folks use it, um, yeah. but getting, you know, getting students to sort of write those math biographies, those, um, are fun. those are fun and those are insightful. And again, it's, it's giving, it's creating space for those, like using activities mm -hmm. to create space for conversations. So I think that's, um, I, I think it's not always well serving to pretend the stereotypes don't exist because every student is aware of them. And so at least from my experience yeah. is, is a, approaching it in a slightly more head on way seems to be helpful. Um, and, you know, I think more subtly, the ways that we facilitate um, our class discussions can also be a mechanism for deconstructing those stereotypes. Oh, okay. And that could be um, well, I think, you know, like Francis Sue talks about like these math microaggressions, calling yeah. things 
trivial or that's the favorite one this is tr proof trivial i remember the number of grad like math books i read it's like lax is like part a trivial part b trivial part c trivial part d follows from a b and c and i'm like <laughs> but you didn't prove them <laughs> um, just nothing like that to make you feel <laughs> and then if you don't know how to do it then you feel like oh i, I yeah i must not be good at math you know. Exactly. And, and then and that connects into the racialized, the gender, the, the yeah. disability types of things. And so um, really the way that we talk about the math, but then also how how we ask questions. Is the question always get the answer or is a question, could it be related to process? Could it be related yeah. to productive struggle? Um, and then who do we ask those questions? So I think, right. again, you know, the work in complex instruction um, and, you know, Rachel Lotan and Lisa Joke and others have just done such cool stuff there, but using ways to assign competence um, mm -hmm. to students. And I want, I want to unpack what that means. Um, and so, you know, in my work, we've sort of framed it. Um, this is with Charles Wilkes to frame it as like this kind of like three step thing of like, we need to know first, we need to know who are the low status students in our classroom or who students perceived as low status, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and we need to then identify opportunities when they do make an important contribution. That's often could be in a group work or, other, or something like that. And then we need to, to draw attention to that publicly in a way that's not it's not saying good job. It's not this kind of empty yeah. praise, right. But, right. but in a way that highlights the mathematical contribution. Um, and the thing that's beautiful is well, complex instruction work has done it, but some of our recent research is like using the equip tool, we can empirically document the the increase in student participation um, from minoritized students when st instructors are using these strategies, um, which is just it's beautiful. What what a better way to deconstruct stereotypes than like right in front of your students locally, showing them like, oh, you know, that that person's in the back of the class, I feel like they're not engaged. And it's like, boom, no, they have this mathematical brilliance that that everyone can learn from. And, and mm -hmm. so sort of seeing that everyday brilliance that all of our students bring, but, but making it public rather than right. just shining the spotlight on the same few students again and again in a way that reinforces the stereotype. That's right, so it, it really, I like this a lot because it, it really highlights that um, there's a specific, there are specific things we can do that actually can shift these stereotypes. And right. it's not, um, you know, you show a movie or you're cheerleading and, and praising. You're actually, your teaching technique is specifically yeah. being uh, implemented in yeah. a way that is shifting it in a meaningful way. So yeah. like if someone's in the back of the room who's low status and, and then you uh, highlight them, like, oh, you visit they have a great solution. Hey, so-and-so has this awesome idea and they share it and everyone's like, Oh, yeah. that's a great idea. Yeah. That's, that's like hitting, right. you know, that's, that's a, that's a golden moment. Super powerful. It's super powerful. Yeah, I've seen that, that, you know, people talk about this as like success mm -hmm. breeding yeah. confidence or success yeah. and like this authentic experience yeah. where people like get validated in a way, but it wasn't like contrived or forced or yeah. anything. It's like, my idea actually is legit. Right. This, yeah. The, yeah. You're, yeah, you're drawing out their their brilliance. It's not like you could you can't assign competence to like something that's not mathematically meaningful. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. work that way. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, caveat: this is hard to do. This takes oh, yeah, no, this takes a lot of practice to do it well. Yeah, yeah. it's not it's, it's it's not hard to do. And also, there's like a, a piece that precedes it is like having good questions that lead yeah, up to questions. this. And then you're yeah. making a friendly environment for people to share. Exactly. They trust you. They they share with you. And yeah. then you take that uh, moment yeah. and you and you use it. Exactly. Um, it's it doesn't happen just because you decided on a Tuesday to just to teach a little bit differently, right. but it's also doable. I think. Yeah. It's hard but doable. Yeah. Nice. I like it. That's a good one. All right. So we're kind of getting into what's happening in the classroom. So um, partners, groups, whole class discussion. So mm -hmm. active learning. You know, we yeah. we've talked about this a lot the last few years about how it's not automatically inclusive. And then when you open up uh, spaces for people to talk, they can reenact yeah. the same yeah. uh, social hierarchies. Yep. Um, and so then we need to kind of do this. So there are some pluses and minuses of mm -hmm. different 
um, ways to organize pairs, like say small yeah. groups and whole class discussions. Yep. Um, and then another thing that you write in your book, which I think was is important, is that there are very few whole class discussions you observe that are equitable. It's really, right. uh, I was like, well, and I, and I feel that as it's yeah. that's really hard when I have a, a so often lately I've been teaching these courses with like 180 students. Yeah. It's really hard to make that yeah. an equitable space when you only have so many exactly. uh, opportunities for people to go to bat, let's say, yeah. in class. Yeah. That's really hard. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I teach differently now. I won't, I'm not talking about how I teach, but I'm just saying like that yeah. has changed how I yeah. teach compared to when I had 25 students and more opportunities yeah. for people to shine. So anyways, yeah. those are some things. Um, let's talk about you know, pluses and minuses, um, yeah. techniques. Yeah. So, yeah. So think? this is great. Yeah. So, I mean, so just to put it in context, right. So the work that we've been doing with equip, you know, we've just, we've just observed hundreds of classrooms at this point. And it's, there's kind of like a default dynamic that, that happens unless an instructor is disrupting that. And it's, it's aligned directly with those discourses that we already talked about. Right. Mm -hmm. We sort of see that kind of white masculine, not, not always white, but often white, masculine, uh, non-disabled sort of presence where there's can be a, a a few very vocal students dominate the class session, yeah. right? It's like, you know, it's like you're teaching calculus and then the student says like, well, you know, I'm curious, how does this problem relate to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? And it's like, <laughs> it has nothing to do really <laughs> other than like this, the student is performing smartness um, in a way that can alienate other students. And so like, you know, I just see those kind of things all the time. And right. we, we see it happen at, at our conferences, yeah. right? We, in, oh, yeah. in meetings, faculty meetings, all, <laughs> yeah. all that stuff. Um, yeah. So these patterns are, they're very entrenched. They're very robust. And so that's like when there's a whole class discussion, unless an instructor is really using explicit strategies and using them well, that is the pattern that we observe okay. every time, every time. Um, and so, you know, we've talked about a little bit of those things, but, you know, things like, um, well, so first you might just ask like, why even do a whole class discussion? If it's so inequitable, just like avoid it. Um, but I think there's important pedagogical reasons mm -hmm. that we want there to um, synthesize the work that happens across a class. You know, if we're doing this inquiry-based learning or, you know, extensive group work, this, um, we actually have the chance to connect multiple different perspectives and solution paths, right? Ac across groups. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful for building conceptual understanding. So there's really good reasons to do it. And also the positioning of students when student, you know, this assigning mm -hmm. competence, when that happens publicly, it's, it's nice if it happens in a small group, but it happens in front of the whole class. That's really putting a spotlight on um, yeah. something fantastic. So someone's done. So it's, it, there's a lot, a lot of benefit, um, but keeping in mind, we have to put guardrails to make it equitable yeah. or it probably won't be. Um, so, you know, I, using whole class, but if our only method is whole class discussion, um, that that really limits the engagement opportunity. So I, I like to have like a, it's kind of like putting together like a dinner or something. I don't know, I'm gonna run with this analogy. Okay. But like Let's you need it. like some appetizers and you wanna have like maybe some drinks and you have a uh, main course and dessert. It's like you dessert is great, but you can't only eat the dessert. Um, and mm -hmm. so you need all these pieces to come together. And so like the, you know, individual think time is it can be useful in, in small doses, chances to talk with partners, um, group work. I think they're all good and they all have their places. And in the book, I, I spent quite a bit of time talking about like what strategies you might use for different things. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you know, sometimes I think we equate group work with like active learning means group work and group work is great when you have a good task when you've set your students up to succeed you have community agreements you have all that stuff but it's also it takes a lot of practice to enact it well and i think even for folks who are skilled like it doesn't work well all the time in all situations always so it's it's right. very powerful but um we have to keep in mind the inequities that can arise and be ready to address them. Whereas I think something like partner conversations are not good for everything, um, but almost by default, there's tends to be a back and forth exchange between both students mm -hmm. where it's not like 
you know, the dynamic where like the dysfunctional group dynamic where like two students are just doing nothing. One student's like on their phone and like someone else dominates, right? That That is more common without intervention. Whereas that, I think partners can be an easier on-ramp, but it, it, not good for everything. It's not good for everything. Although I find like it's it's a useful uh, starting place. Like let's mm -hmm. say you just got your PhD or you know you just got out of grad school and you're starting to teach and then and just thinking practically designing a really good active learning thing can be a huge time sink and then mm -hmm. you know yeah. uh, and also if you don't know your students yet because you're at new at a new you know, you're new at a new at a position somewhere and in, in a different campus all those things and then partner time can also um you can yeah. decide to do it on the fly yeah. as opposed to you know if you're going through your class and also right. like, let's just do this gnarly group activity. Like that's not something you, you want to just do on, you know, wing <laughs> no. but you, yeah, but you can no. do, Hey, we just did a hard example. Why don't you turn and talk to your yeah. partner and then, you know, come up with a question. Absolutely. I mean, that's something you, you could definitely do. No, I'm, I'm a hundred percent behind you. And, and that, I think that's in a lot of ways, the approach that we've taken working with uh, college math instructors is like, let's start small let's work with kind of the incremental changes because, you know, well, here, here's a great example with the, the turn and talk is like, <clears throat> you ask a question to your class and you get crickets mm -hmm. and you're like, okay, well, I know I've, I've read the literature. I know wait time. I got to wait like 10 seconds and you do that. And it's still crickets. You kind of have choices you could answer your own question. I wouldn't do that. That tends to not be helpful. You could simplify the question, which could be helpful, but you could also use that turn and talk, right? And say like, well, wow, this is really hard. Maybe you should talk to a partner about it for a couple of minutes and then let's come back. Yeah. And, and then you could use that time, both to support the think time, but then um, you can kind of eavesdrop on those conversations and mm -hmm. figure out why your question didn't land the way you thought it would. Um, and so I think that's relatively, uh, you know, it's not trivial. It's not trivial to do that, but it's it's, it's a very learnable skill that um, instructors yeah. can learn with just a little bit of practice and mm -hmm. use very very effectively. Yeah, and I and I think it's also uh, practicing some key things like going like eavesdropping or going over and visiting some pairs, and you're listening to students, mm -hmm. and then you're trying to uh, inquire about what they're thinking or saying. Yeah. That's an important thing to practice, which you need when you're, you're going to do, say, groups of four people. Exactly. Right. So yeah, good yeah. on ramp. Good on ramp. Totally. And you can use it, like you said, like in a moment where crickets. Okay, well, this is my signal for a turn and talk. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, you've, so we've talked a lot about assigning competence. Uh, what about intentionality in bringing in students? So if we just say. Yeah. So what do you guys think? And then it's always like the 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 a vocal five or the fab exactly. five, right? Yeah. So what can you do with some intentional a calling in this case or, or right? Yeah. So writing? there's I mean so you know sort of perhaps one. So so just to just reiterate, I think if you if you do that and you don't, you know, this is probably the most inequitable thing we see is like teachers want a very kind of casual flow. So we ask those questions and we don't even have students raise their hands. Then it's like always the fastest and loudest students just shout it out and, and just sort of shut out everybody else. Mm -hmm. So getting some kind of hand raising, um, you know, in the book, I talk about like the strategy of asking for multiple hands mm -hmm. is one way to slow down. Well, you know, I want everyone to think about this. When I see five hands, I'm going to call on someone. Mm -hmm. And then like to, you can sometimes once you have the right culture, like you don't always have to call on one of those students. You can sometimes call on someone else too. Um, <laughs> okay, it, those are great not, hands. Right. Okay, those are nice. But I, I, really, I want to hear what Stan thinks about this. You <laughs> That's know? right. Yeah. Oh no, um, I was. I was. Yeah. If you do it right, it's it's not cold call you, but it's yeah, just yeah. you have to build the right classroom culture. Um, yeah. So that those are fine. But I think even better than that is, um, maybe not better, but an, another way to do this is with both the you know that turn and talk option if i have students that i know i want to get involved in the class because they're typically quiet i'm going to choose to eavesdrop on their conversations oh yeah because that gives me a chance to bring them in and i can say i can when i'm hearing them like that's a really interesting point you know when we come back 
would you mind sharing that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They say, yes, great. If they say no, I was like, could I share that you shared that? Mm -hmm. And usually students won't say no to that. They yeah, might. Yeah, yeah. And then might, it's like, okay, right. fine. Let me share it anonymously. And then, you know, there's sort of levels, but, but usually if you, if you tell a student that that's a useful idea, can they share it? Like most students will, will say yes in my experience. Um, so I think that intentionality is good. I really like, um, there's sort of, this is a bit more elaborate, but this idea um, of the five practices for math discussions Mm -hmm. And this, this actually comes out of K-12 work. Um, and I, you know, I'll be honest, I kind of forget what all five of them are. Um, but the key idea here is sort of this, um, you know, monitoring what happens during group work time. And so the way I would do this is like, even have like a clipboard. Uh -huh. and like Because, you know, 30 minute group work, whatever, 20 minute, sort of by the end of that, you've forgotten half of what happened. So I can write down ideas coming up in groups who had those ideas. Again, I can sort of tell the students I wanna share that. Um, and then after, you know, you've sort of synthesized that, um, you know, maybe I have five ideas on there with different names. I can kind of choose an order for what's like a logical order to build this out as part of a mathematical discussion. Well, I want Stan to go third, but I want Robin to go first, you know, Rachel's gonna go second, whatever. And so then you can actually bring the students intentionally into the conversation. So you've basically orchestrated this conversation, um, as, but functionally around student ideas and, and you can use it to assign competence to students in a way that feels very organic, but is very scripted. Um, and so that's, yeah. that's entirely different. And the conversations that come out are entirely different from, hey, we did this work. Does someone want to share with me? Um, I think it can be useful to do both of those things. But I, I especially feel if there's this particular um, conceptual understanding that you're trying to build from a task, orchestrating the discussion in that way is, is very powerful. Um, but that also requires, first of all, practice with facilitation, but also like you need to have, you need to know something about the task and what students tend to do, or it, it's, it's kind of challenging yeah. to pull it off on the fly. I mean, not that's that right. you can't do it, but it's not easy to do. That's right. That's right. I mean, yeah, you're right. So this is where you do have to prep <laughs> if you're doing mm -hmm. an activity like this and do the problems uh, and kind of, or know the, like the, like the typical things, even if yeah. you don't though, like let's say you're in a calculus class and you're having people working on like op optimization problem, you could go around and say like, oh, yeah. I found three different approaches. Exactly. I'm going to call on these three groups to share Exactly. And orchestrating. So I think one of the things you're highlighting too is that when we have volunteers, you're asking the students to opt in. Right. Whereas when you're orchestrating, you're asking students to share, which they yeah. you normally will say yes in some form. You might have to right. do it for them, but they have to opt out of sharing. They're opting and then out. you can then make sure that, you know, I haven't heard from these people in yeah. a while. I'm going to make exactly. sure I ask them. So that way, then the exactly you, you're not letting uh, randomness or the students drive like who's volunteering. You're yeah. you're in control of that, and this you're that's a power that uh, instructors have that I think right. uh, are not generally using. I fully agree with you, and that's yeah. one of the things that's come out um, strongly in the research. Is you know, with faculty we've worked through, and then we talk about their experiences, mm -hmm. and a lot of folks will say. I didn't realize I could control participation. I thought mm -hmm. I was just kind of stuck with the dynamics that I inherited on day one. Mm -hmm. um, and they, yeah, we're sort of giving away our power, right? In the classroom, we, as an instructor, we have so much power. It's not always easy to do these things, mm -hmm. but we shape the classroom setting more than anybody else does. Absolutely. Um, but whether or not we use it is a, is a different yeah. thing. Um, and right. so, yeah, I think, you know, and, and plus, it's very different to ask somebody to share publicly in a whole class setting versus asking them one-on-one -on -one when they have sort of like think time, prep time, all of that. It's it's just, it's it's not like cold calling. It can be very threatening. Yeah. And I think I don't this like is much calling. more inviting. Yeah, you're right. It's like warm calling. <laughs> warm, warm calling, calling. Warm sure. Warm calling. Yes. And you visit them and you can actually have a conversation. Like, exactly. you know, like, like uh, Daniel, like, I think this idea is worth sharing with the whole right. class. Would you mind doing it? Yeah. That's different than 
you know, you have your, you know, your, you know, your glasses down, your clipboard. All right, Daniel, what did you get? You know, which exactly. is like, oh, what if I'm wrong? Right. You know. <laughs> yep. Totally. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it's good. I like this. I like this. All right. Um, let's roll on here. Uh, okay. So the next thing is like, um, you know, when we, when you go through the first part of your book, you read these yeah. discourses and you, and, and you mm -hmm. think about society, it can be really daunting. Like, oh my gosh, yeah. what can I do? I'm just a math teacher at such and such place. And what can I do? Yeah. Uh, but we can do something. We've talked about mm -hmm. this. So um, let's talk about uh, like, you know, first steps that people can make. I mean, are these, mm -hmm. do they make a difference? What do yeah. you know from the data? Yeah, absolutely. So here I, I want to just lay out a little bit more in detail kind of the work I've been doing to, to help you understand what what the evidence for these claims is. Good idea. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I've, I've kind of alluded to a few times this equip tool that Nero mm -hmm. and I built, but essentially it's a way of tracking student participation, um, but we don't just track the amount, we track also the nature, right? What types of things these students say, how much do they say? And then we can break that down either by individual students or by groups of students. And so this is key because we talk about these discourses, we talk about these patterns of inequity, mm -hmm. but practically as instructors, we usually don't see them. Or maybe yeah. we're kind of aware of them, but we're not aware of how much it is. And the reason for that is that we're used to existing in a society that's not equitable. And so when we see yeah. patterns that reflect the everyday inequity in our society, Sometimes it's alarming and sometimes we've just become accustomed to this not great way of being. And mm -hmm. so I think what we found is that having the data is more useful than people could ever imagine. And mm -hmm. in another way to put it is that I've yet to give data to somebody who wasn't at least kind of surprised by what the data said. It, you know, our gut impression is one thing. Data is wholly different. So yeah. that's just sort of a... a plugged for the tool as you know this is a free tool open source we'll drop a link for you but okay um, you know either in a formal coaching setting or folks can literally just record your own lesson and code it quickly and just get a sense of what's happening um but you know so much in the book i talk about all these strategies but the strategies only work with intentionality mm -hmm. and without data it's hard to be intentional because we often just don't know what the patterns are, or we just don't know how bad they are. And so I just want to be super frank about that. Like yeah. data helps when we work with faculty, we use the data to guide the process because it shows us where the inequities lie. Yeah. I don't know if you're a baseball fan, it reminds me of like baseball analytics. Like totally, totally. Like, yep. You think you hit the curveball well, but actually the data is. Actually, you did it. You did, yeah. Or just like, you know, it could be anything like, um, you know, exercise, right? People use their Fitbit or, you know, in mm -hmm. the gym, people count how many reps and what weights. It's like, you don't just throw some weights on a bar and be like, yeah, I'm going to try this today. Yeah. It's like, it's very systematic. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. I'm going to go with and, the green ones. <laughs> right, the green ones look good. Let <laughs> yeah. me see if I don't throw out my back on this one. Okay. Um, so you, you being more systematic, we could, I think we can treat... Sometimes we treat teaching like an art and there's aspects of it that are an art, but also we can be very scientific. Mm -hmm. And in, in my work and our work, we found that that is very productive because most of these skills are specific skills that people maybe don't know how to use today, but they can learn to use them and they can learn to use them effectively. So mm -hmm. that's the biggest piece is, is starting with the data. Um, and then typically how we organize the learning is some sort of learning community environment where we're observing folks. Um, generating the data and then reflecting on the data to set specific strategies um, across the meetings. And so that allows us to track change over time. Okay. Um, and so I, I think I put this example in the book, but you know, you've probably, I'm, and I'm sure you've had these conversations, Stan, with folks who are like, I tried IBL and it doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, well, <laughs> you probably didn't do it very well. <laughs> what does it mean that it doesn't work? Like, you know, it, it yeah. can meet specific goals in certain times. But I, I think if we, when we try to change everything overnight, it just, it, it tends to not go well. But when yeah. we, when we start, it, it's, it's, it's constructivism, right? You have to start with what you have and build on that. So as an instructor, yeah. 
you know, you could be a first year grad student. You could be someone who's been teaching for a while. You have skills that you've built and you start with those skills and you build on them in incremental ways because that makes it both more manageable, but also I think increases the likelihood that you will actually successfully implement the thing you're trying to do. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of the things that we've just talked about today are very simple changes, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not hard to be like, I'm going to have you raise your hands. It's not hard to say, like, turn to a partner and talk. These are very, it might take a little practice to do these things well. They might feel awkward at first. The, a lot of the basic changes are are pretty, pretty doable. And those start to mm -hmm. move towards complicated things like five practices or assigning competence or running a full inquiry based lesson that frankly take a lot more practice and skill to do. Um, but are things that everybody can strive towards and build towards. Mm -hmm. And so that's, we, we talked about yeah. this, like, and they also contain the necessary um, building block skills, exactly. like listening to students. If you do turn and talk, you're listening to students, yeah. which you need in all the other forms of Absolutely, teaching. right? It's, a, it's, a, it's the same way, right? You, even in math, we see how the content builds on it. It's mm -hmm. kind of the same with teaching. Yeah. Start start with something and build up to, to bigger and, and larger things. And so I think... The other thing that's encouraging is what we find empirically is that even with making a few of these small changes, um, it has a really big impact. So let me give another example and, um, and another example that's simple. Um, let's say we're doing group work. You know, if you say we're going to have one person from each group share, um, the person who volunteers to share is what we would predict based on these stereotypes. Um, but another way you could do it is be like, at the beginning of the group work, like, okay, um, now, you know, the student whose birthday is coming up next, I don't know. But when we come back, that student from the group is going to be the one to share, or people mm -hmm. do things with group roles. Um, so it could be random, or it could be more targeted. But either of those things is still giving students a chance to prepare. It's It's a warm calling. Um, but it's also disrupting those sort of status quo patterns. Again, th that's a, that's an easy thing to do. Someone can can play with that, and you know, whatever. If you if you can't think of ideas, like send me an email. I'll give you some ideas for how you can choose who talks next. But I, I think everyone has really creative things to bring to the classroom. Right, and just not make it a uh, volunteer opt-in, which then just goes straight back to our defaults in our right. society, but just, well, yeah. as you say, disrupt it by randomness assigning. Exactly. You just go around and say, you, 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 and you are presenting this time. If you keep track and you move it around. Then... Right, right. And I, and I always, I think one thing I, uh, that I believe, even with all of that setup, I I still don't believe if a student is really just like I'm, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I would never try to force a oh, student. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's just just that goes without saying, but it should be said. Um, but yeah. you know, it could be like, okay, well, how about we come back to you later, or or try to give mm -hmm. them another opportunity. But little by little, finding ways to try to get everybody involved meaningfully. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. Maybe next time, right? And then you exactly. say, okay, can so can you do it instead, right? You can just turn. Yeah, it, yeah. It's yeah, not yeah. you're right. I, I like how you say you're you're not making a big deal out of it. Yeah. Um, but you're still like inviting them to come back. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's good. That's good. I like this. Um, so what I also like is that there's like this kind of the role of data and how you actually see these changes. So it's worth it. Uh, to yeah. to do something. Don't sit on the sidelines. Don't wait. Exactly. Till next year or after you get tenure or whatever, you know, I think you can start doing these things now. And yeah, it doesn't have it doesn't have to be. And I think that's part of starting small, right? Rebuilding your entire curriculum, recording like, you know, people do these big things. I'm going to record lecture videos for everything and then flip my class. It's like, wow, that's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Just use a turn and talk. And you, you know, not, not saying turn and talk fixes everything, but starting to make small tweaks already right. makes measurable change. And then you can build on that. And frankly, I think the more that you get better at doing these things, teaching just becomes more fun because it's more yeah. interactive. You yeah. get to know the students. You actually laugh in a math classroom, all, all the good things that, uh, that we make We don't it... talk about this enough, that it's fun. Like, it's not just that 
you know, it's better for students, but, you know, way harder for me. It's more work, right? Um, it, I mean, it is more work at the beginning, but it's fun. You get to, exactly, you, you, I know my students. They know me. Yeah. We have fun together. We have a, uh, one of the things you point out is building a relationship, a professional relationship with these, yeah. these students. Um, yeah. And you also point out, I think this excellent as the enemy of good, that if you try to, if you're going to wait until you're perfect at it, that's also like delaying all these things that yeah. you could be doing, yep. you know, tomorrow. Totally. All right. Uh, let's change gears. Okay. Talk about something that you mentioned in your book. And also you mentioned in like the video they recorded for the meet a mathematician yeah. disability justice. And also we went through uh, COVID-19. We're still going through it. If you look right. at the data, we it's are. not over. We um, are. Uh, and how that really kind of uh, put disability just, and we can't just, you know, we have to we have to confront this now we, we, yeah we, okay so let's talk about that so uh so what are your yeah. thoughts as yeah someone who's disabled right you come yeah. out and talk about that yeah so this is the big one this is big for me personally sort of you know i've kind of grown up i uh, you know disabled in multiple ways but growing up with sort of chronic health um issues really my entire life and mm -hmm. so i don't really have a lot of memories of not being disabled um and then the pandemic hits and it's like, what, what was the marketing? What was the news? Well, it's not that bad unless you're old, unless you're chronically yeah. ill, th then you're going to die, but it's okay. It's just like this public discourse of like disposability yeah. is like really alarming. Um, and so, you know, I, my family and I, we got COVID, you know, and we were, our goal was to be so cautious. We got the first bout of it oh, wow. really in March, 2020, when it was just starting That's to ramp tough. up. That's tough. I think yeah. like, I remember seeing like the cases in San Diego and the case counter was at like 52. And I was like, Oh my God, we are like part of that 52. Um, which was just, we yeah. I, the beginning. I, I, yeah. I've, I mean, I've talked about elsewhere how it happened, but it was, it was a, you know, it kind of tragic. It was a, a meeting on campus and, you know, I was talking to, I had it was the last meeting I attended and I was sharing with folks. I was like, okay, I should I should be out about my disability. Mm -hmm. And it was in that meeting <laughs> that I got oh, it. Wow. Um so oh. the irony is just just brutal. Um and and that just made me realize um, you know, so much I think the the pressures that we face in academia of like productivity to be on all the time, to always be working, to kind of be these like production machines yeah, is just diametrically opposed to being a living and thriving disabled person, right? It's like mm -hmm. not how you just can't live your life that way. Um, I mean, I don't think anyone really lives their whole life the best way that way. Um, but it's just, you know, there's, there's so much like performance that you have to pretend to right. keep up with it. And that that was the sort of moment of reckoning for me was like, I can't pretend I'm not, I can't like do this yeah. performance. Um, and so that pushed me to be a lot more open, um, you know, meet a mathematician. I, I talk more openly about some of these experiences mm -hmm. and um, I have a collaborator and friend, uh, Lizette Torres Gerald. So we've slowly, we're starting to build a community um, called signs of disability for disabled folks in math. Um, mm -hmm. and, and if you look at it, you know, there's, there's extraordinary work that has happened with with projects like, you know, Black and Mathematically Gifted and Lathisms, um, Indigenous Mathematicians, uh, Spectra. You can sort of think about all these minoritized identities in math. Mm -hmm. And then disability is still like stigmatized and just like not folks aren't talking about it. Um, not only that, but like in the pandemic, even now, you know, the ableism, the, the, the right. language around, well, you know, some people are going to die because yeah. they're, you know, disabled or older. Like, I was like, that's not okay. You wouldn't say right. that about any identity. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, otherwise, so, you know, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I just seem like it's also like an invisible, uh, yeah. a lot of disabilities are invisible disabilities, which then right. uh, you're like, you're saying that you've sort of not shared so that, right. right yeah. And then you don't feel comfortable to share it. Yeah. And then the pandemic comes and life is just too hard yeah. and okay, well. Yeah, then it happens. But I but I mean I can also I think now I can do that also from a place of privilege as you know, I have tenure, I sort mm -hmm. of have certain protections, right? Yeah. Um, that I didn't have for most of my life. And so that's 
that sort of became the moment for me. Like, okay, how do how do we try to pay it forward to other folks who mm -hmm. are who you know grad students who are in a much more vulnerable position, mm -hmm. but you know want to be a part of the community? How do we how do we make space for them? Um, and so that's that's what we're trying to do with signs of disability. Um, so mm -hmm. if you or someone you know in your life might identify with that, you know, okay. hit me up and we'd love to connect. Okay. Um, and I think I'll say like that's what tenure is for is to go right. to bat for people. Right. That's one reason. Um, and then like how can people so equity, if we think about we've we typically talk about equity in terms of gender and race, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, but not so much about disability. And I feel like this the pandemic mm -hmm. kind of woke us up. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't thinking about it as much yeah. as I should have, to to my shame and to all our shame, I think. But how do we how do we help? Like going forward, we should we shouldn't yeah. just go back to 2019 and just right. forget about all the disabled right. you know things you know people whatever that we were trying to do. Yeah, yeah. But, and so I think that's a great question. I mean, one thing I just would kind of plug is like all of these identities play out together, right? So mm -hmm. for like folks who are multiply minoritized, disability yeah. and race and other things have have a different experience than I might have an experience, and so. I think we we got to look at all all the webs yeah. of of intersection. Um, but you know, one of the things that that also came up um, in COVID nineteen is like certain things like remote work, for example. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of disabled folks have been asking for that for decades. Yeah. And suddenly, when everybody needed it, it became available. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of still here, but also aspects of it are disappearing. And so folks are like, "Oh, but I still need that." Yeah. Um, and so I think similarly, um, as much as maybe some of us hate being on a Zoom meeting, um, we're on one now. <laughs> I know there's there can be benefits, you know, like in the we did because I did we did a lot of research around teaching and like actually the fact that we have sort of this audio stream plus chat plus yeah. private chat actually allowed for a lot of different forms of participation. Mm -hmm. Um in some ways that could be more equitable um, at times. I mean, there was there's still downsides to that medium, but there there actually were upsides too. Yeah, um, so, I think we all yeah. wish we had chat in a classroom, like we right. have on Zoom. I mean, I've seen do people it. do this with yeah. Twitter. I've never done it, but I've seen like, almost like a Twitter live stream in a class and session. Like, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, there's, so there could be, there might be ways that, you know, folks do with discord or yeah. Slack or whatever it could be. Um, but I, I don't have a lot of experience with that, but so I think more broadly, um, you know, we've known for a long time, like in grad school, there's, there's a mental health crisis, right? You know, I think well over half of students sort of report struggling with, you know, mental illness or kind of anxiety or depression or these things. And it's like, that can't be right. Like, mm -hmm. is that what it means to become a doctor is that you have to be anxious just to get through your program. Um, so I think these these issues have been around a long time, we just kind of ignore them. Um, and I, I feel, um, you know, just just really quick, there's there's some stuff of this in the book, but like, even just conversations around access, right? Asking, mm -hmm. this is so you know, sort of it's become common now to like talk about like names and pronouns. Um, but the thing that, um, you know, has one thing from disability justice is like normalizing the talk around access. Yeah, I like that. It's in your book, too. Mm -hmm. Like just make access a thing that you put, you know, in your syllabus somewhere. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or, um, you know, there was another framing that I really liked. Uh, this is from Indigo Esmon. Uh, but like asking this question, what do you need to do your best work? Right. And And that's that could be framed around disability, but it could be framed around other things. Mm -hmm. um, but sort of like, like acknowledging that we're people and we have bodies yeah. and we have needs and we get sick or we take care of kids or like, we're not just production robots. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's great. All right. Well, let's, we should, we should work on this together. You know, that would uh, be great. I, I'm, I'm willing to help out on this. As someone, That's great. Let's uh, talk more. Was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's do the outro. So okay. these are fun. Okay, so we know you uh, you like punk rock, but favorite music or 
I like I love all kinds of music, but I'm gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna go with like like Scandinavian power metal. That's sort of okay, the thing for really? me. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna ask the, you for a recommendation that I can start. <laughs> yeah, like this. Yeah. I mean, Night Nightwish is sort of the band that everybody knows. But there's a lot of other other good ones, but just right. like the mix of like the orchestral instruments plus mm -hmm. um, powerful vocals, and you know, I, I'm in it for the drums, really technical okay. and exciting and fun musically okay um i, I love it so you have a yeah favorite, you have a favorite drummer <laughs> or i don't have one particular no there's there's too many good there's too ones, many too many yeah there's okay. too many jazz power yeah. metal there's just there's just too many okay 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 we won't go that'll, that'll be a whole other uh, a whole hour other, yeah. yes okay uh, favorite food do you have your favorite food that's a great question. Well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this one out there. So actually, so I I developed an egg allergy five years ago. Okay. Um, and wow, are eggs in everything? And also, do people not realize eggs are in everything? Um, and so it also turns out that over time, you can build you can build immunity to um, allergens <laughs> very slowly and very carefully. Okay. So I've been building that up. So now oh, nice. so eggs are going to be my favorite food that has also tries yes. to kill me. Um, <laughs> but uh, yes, that's the one that gives that's that gets good. more attention than any other one for me. Okay, good. All right. Because eggs are like in so many things. So everything. You, everything. Yeah, I know. Oh, my gosh. All right. So the last one is uh, you live in San Diego. So lucky you. Any favorite activities that you do in the area? I I love the fact that I can be outdoors basically the entire year. I love hiking. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's what here, I miss. <laughs> going to the beach yeah. sort of all that it may be a stereotypical but i just no, it's love a... love the space it's really we're we're too spoiled here um mm -hmm. but it's it's really great yeah well i i was born and raised in la and what happens is you get connected to the land you yeah you you, you know it's kind of a uh in a way that i think it's it's hard to describe for me exactly. at least but good yeah, exactly well, Daniel, thanks so much. You're doing so much for our profession. So thank you for all your awesome work. And uh, we should talk again about some of these other topics that we touched on that we could get into. Yeah. Yeah. And I right. don't wanna, thank you, Stan. Yeah, it's such a, such a pleasure to chat with you. Um, and, you know, I really appreciate you having me. All right. Thanks.